It means the election is almost over, but it also means the temperatures outside of our Austin studio are finally below 90 degrees. Okay, folks, there, there's your weather report. Bill Colhane, along with my co-host, Tony Callis, thanks for visiting us at the Big Bid Theory. The mailbag has returned. I hear the applause. And we also have a special guest who will provide some background details and suggestions on process improvement. Tony will close down the show with crazy bids, of course. Tony, a lot ahead of us, but first, how do you like our updated studio here in Bid Prime's new facility? I'm very impressed, Bill. I can't, I can't lie. Uh, the bosses did a great job hooking us up. Yeah, you look around here. We, Lauren is excited because she has some new toys to play with behind the glass. So, uh, hi, Lauren. She's giving us. She's saying, "Let's hurry along." So she's right. The emails keep arriving on our doorstep. For that, we're grateful. Encourage you to, to please keep sending them in. Tony and I love emails. Uh, Tony, you're going to tackle the first question, and it's from Stacy out in Denver. She asks, we're coming to Austin next month for a conference at the Austin Convention Center. Where are the best live music venues? You get, you get out a lot more than I do. Yeah, I definitely, uh, number one local recommendation, stay away from Dirty 6th Street. That's anything east of Congress but, uh, and west of 35. Okay. Uh, you want to hit up uh, the Art District on the east side, uh, right around Cesar Chavez to 7th Street. And then as well as West 6th Street, which is anything obviously west of Congress on 6th Street. And then there's also a great area called Rainy Street, right by Hotel Van Zandt. And even Hotel Van Zandt has live music on Fridays and Saturday nights. Well, very good. And by the way, they're not a sponsor of this show. Tony has actually been to those places. Now, we didn't get to this next question in our last mailbag segment. Jacob out of Pittsburgh wanted to know, what are the plans for next season of our show? Well, a lot. As a matter of fact, Season two is going to be coming to an end in, in, in the near future, but have no fear. It's not, you know, anytime soon. But when Tony and I do take our hiatus, as we did last season, we'll, we will roll out some best of season episodes. Uh, for example, you know, we've had some special guests on also the, the best of crazy bits. So we will uh, keep everybody up to date on what's going on uh, until we start uh, season three of the podcast. And we, We'll continue to have on what we hope to, to be, continue to be, interesting and informative guest as well. So thanks for the question there. Appreciate it, Jacob. Now, question three, I've been impressed how your show has grown. I'm starting a business podcast, hopefully in the next month. What are some suggestions? And that's from Matt in Scottsdale, Arizona. First of all, thanks for the kind words, Matt. And by the way, Matt isn't a relative. But uh, Tony, you start. What, what are some things that you could... Uh, Pass along to Matt. I would say uh, prepare, prepare, prepare. Always prepare for every episode. Uh, you can't prepare enough. And the couple things I'll add to that, Matt, and, and best of luck, by the way. Uh, first of all, I would start with podcast about something you enjoy talking about. That may sound obvious, but if you enjoy skiing and snowboarding, well, don't do a podcast about sitting on the beach if you don't enjoy being near the ocean. And then also... Yeah, like we've started doing, particularly here in season two, I think it really adds to your show if you have interesting guests on. There are a few things that, that immediately come to mind. And speaking of interesting guests, that's exactly what we did yet again. I say with confidence, it's likely that you, your business, are always looking to get better. I know we do that here. Process improvement can be, it should be, a part of your strategy and so with our never-ending goal of sharing news you can use in conversation that provides answers and provokes questions, we're excited and proud to bring on our next guest. Chuck Cox from Firefly Consulting was a featured author for the book Innovating Lean Six Sigma, released by McGraw-Hill earlier here in 2016. More on Lean Six Sigma in a moment. Tony's going to ask Chuck about that. As he mentioned to me yesterday on a pre-production call, Chuck's well-traveled. Chuck has three decades of performance improvement experience in both transactional and manufacturing environments. He's advised all levels, and I'm talking senior execs, 
middle managers, supervisors, individuals. He's worked with them all. You look at his track record. He has saved his clients millions of dollars, reducing cycle times. Look at this number, more than 70% streamlined processes and fundamentally changed enterprise operations and organizations competitive position in the market. How about that? You talk about a resume. So with no further ado, here's our visit with Chuck Cox. Chuck is now on the Big Bid Theory hotline from just outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Chuck, welcome and, and thank you. How, how are things going over in your part of the world this morning? Great. The, uh, the Phoenix weather is finally getting to be uh, reasonable. <laughs> We've gotten out of the 115 degree day, so it's it's great yeah. to wander around the, the neighborhood and, and soak up the sun without being overwhelming. Yeah, I, I hear you. As a matter of fact, Tony and I mentioned at the the start of the show, temperatures are are now south of 90 degrees here in Austin. So we we're kind of celebrating. Chuck, let's go ahead and, and start on the ground floor. We've all heard the the passionate cries of, "Oh, that's the way we've always done things around here," and you know, usually that's the battle cry for some, even as the ship is headed towards the bottom of the ocean. In your opinion, why is process improvement important to a business organization? And the second part of that, I guess, would be how should a business manage their associated expectations? Basically, we're dealing with something that an awful lot of people realize up front, but stated formally, it's no company or organization automatically gets better or for that matter, even stays at their current level of performance. The operations performance of a company is a result of the sum of its processes. So well-run companies have really good processes to support their people to do their jobs well. And if there's no attention given to the company's processes, they will tend to get worse. They will become more costly, take more time, produce lower quality output, the organization will be less nimble. To use the classic measures in the vernacular, good, fast, cheap, and flexible. Good, of course, quality, fast to cycle time, how fast you can go from what the customer asked for to delivering it, cheap being what's the value that the customer sees in it. And flexible means how useful, uh, how much utility are you getting out of your, your limited assets, the ones that are most valuable to you. Might be people, could be capital assets. So organizations exist to satisfy the needs of customers. The better they do it, the longer they're likely to stay in business and be profitable, even exceedingly profitable. There are both the persons inside the organization, we call them sometimes internal customers, and outside, called external customers. Engineers use the term entropy, which means tendency towards disorder to describe this natural tendency for things to go haywire. Many of us in the rest of the world uh, are attuned to Murphy's Law. You know, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong, and usually at the most disadvantageous time. So, Process improvement is important because without a formal plan for working on improving the organization's processes, they will just become worse over time. And for the most part, the processes often get worse so slowly that few people internally realize it. External customers may realize it because they're comparing companies in the competitive business environment. Sure. Additionally, process improvement is important because of the fairly rapid changes in the business environment that we all operate in. So companies compete to deliver better products and services in an era when the supporting technologies are constantly changing and the means for producing and delivering goods and services are constantly getting more effective and efficient. It's hard to keep up in many industries with all this change, never mind to be able to leverage that change to the company's advantage. And taking new approaches and meeting our customers' needs is not only possible, but in many instances, leveraging this new technology and doing it fast is the only way to keep and increase your pool of customers. That's why it's important if you're looking at getting involved in a process improvement initiative from the outset, success has got to be defined from the perspective of the senior leadership team. The classic natural level definitions of success I just talked about, good, fast, cheap, and flexible, whatever combination of these that the senior leadership team is focused on, that has got to be the basis for your process improvement efforts. As the world around the organization changes and the strategy of the organization changes, the focus of process improvement will reflect that change. Process improvement, after all, is the one actionable lever that the senior leadership team can depend on to assist the implementation of their strategies. Outstanding companies have really good process improvement initiatives 
to assist the implementation of their strategy and reach their strategic goals quickly. And Chuck, when you're talking about process improvement, it really doesn't matter if you're a two, three, four person business or a Fortune 500 company, right? Absolutely. And anybody who is delivering products and services to customers has processes. And sometimes the, the smaller organizations are a little bit more challenging because you have one person uh, perhaps wearing several hats. Right. So it's, it's essential that, that they understand how all these processes work so that they can deliver the maximum value to the customer. Maximum value to the customer means the customer is willing to pay you for that. That's the right. essence of being in business. Yeah, no doubt. Now, what about the, the second part about managing expectations? We, we live kind of in that microwave society where everybody wants results right now. Before embarking on a process improvement initiative, how do you manage your expectations? The most successful process improvement efforts, the one that give the most bang for the buck, are ones that have the active support and engagement of the senior leadership team. And the goals of the process improvement effort are driven by, and they come directly from, the goals of that senior leadership team. When that happens, the senior leadership team then is willing to give adequate resources to get the results of the improvement efforts in a timely fashion. So it's not an afterthought. Process improvement becomes one of the integral functions of the company, and as such, it has a set of metrics that extend down into the lowest part of that operation that reflect the overall company goals, and they will show that progress is being made. Strategy might be something that's revisited once or twice a year. Process improvement is a day-to-day effort, and it needs the senior leadership team involvement at least once a month, whereas middle management might have weekly meetings and in those meetings, they discuss process improvement efforts as part. And also, you've got individual contributors in the organization. They'll have metrics that they themselves have come up with that support the processes they're involved in, as well as supporting their own development. So those, those are the elements that have to be there if you're going to be effective in a, the design of a process improvement effort. Great point there, Chuck, about setting goals, evaluating, assessing where you are before before moving forward. Now, I understand that that typical of most things, one size doesn't fit all, but what are some of the more common characteristics of an effective process improvement design? Or are there, is there kind of a, a standard, again, regardless of what you do, regardless of the size of your business, what does a, a typical process improvement design look like? You, you've got to have, at the very beginning, an understanding of what your process improvement efforts are supposed to yield to the company. This is not something you're doing because you think it's a good idea. You're doing this because it's going to give tangible benefits to the company. Now, tangible benefits might be you're going to increase profits. It might be that you're going to increase your market share. It might be that you're going to be more efficient in handling your inventory. It might. It can be any one of the things that the company feels are really vital. This is, this is not something that's make work. This is essential to the company becoming more successful. So whatever it is that the organization is trying to accomplish, that has to be an integral part of why you're setting up the improvement of your processes. If you don't address that issue, if it's something that, you know, you've got a young engineer and you don't quite know what to, to put him on, you say, why don't you go over there and work on improving that? No, 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 no. <laughs> process improvement has to be really, really important, and it has to be focused on those things that the senior leadership team thinks are important. So every company has problems. What are your most important problems? Put your process improvement efforts in that area. This is uh, Tony Callis, and we're with uh, Chuck Cox from Firefly Consulting. He's with us today. Uh, Chuck, I do have a, a, a great question for you. What is Lean Six Sigma? Well, Lean Six Sigma is the latest version of improvement, and it's, it's well regarded across many, many industries. Some of the, the thought leaders in, for instance, the healthcare industry uh, got involved with Lean uh, about 15, 18 years ago and, and began, in fact, sent some people down to Japan uh, to find out more about the, the Toyota uh, production system, which is now called uh, Lean. It's evolved into that terminology, and that particular healthcare organization 
has been using lean, which everybody says is great for producing cars, but it really doesn't affect anything else. Well, the fact is that lean principles apply in any organization, whether you're somebody in the credit card business or you're somebody in insurance or whether you're manufacturing cars, lean is extremely important. It's a process, Lean Six Sigma is a process improvement approach that combines waste identification and removal of that waste from the process. Six Sigma is reduction in variation throughout the process. So its focus is uh, getting rid of uh, variation, which is another way of saying uh, addressing quality issues. And the two of them work together so that each leverages the other. At the beginning of a, of a given process improvement project, we often don't know whether one approach will be the one that is the one that uh, makes the most improvement, but we do know that when you do that first round, if you use lean tools, then it's conceivable that what you learn during that first round will introduce you to some opportunities to use Six Sigma tools and vice versa. You never know. So these tools are very synergistic. It's truly a case of 2 plus 2 equals 7, or I've even seen 2 plus 2 equals 12. That's what Lean Six Sigma is. And at some point in time, uh, we'll take and we'll evolve to the next higher level. I mean, there was a day when we just talked about continuous improvement, and then we talked about total quality management. Lean Six Sigma is here. I think the one right around the corner is going to be process excellence or operational excellence, something like that. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not prevalent, so I don't know what the new, new word will be. But it will include these tools and concepts that we already know. Well, and I'll say this. This is Bill again. I'll jump in. In preparation for this interview, I did some research, some looking for some background on Lean Six Sigma, and I just encourage our listening audience, go to Twitter and use hashtag Lean Six Sigma and look at all the rave reviews out there uh, about that approach. Uh, this really rolls us into the next question. This is great stuff. It's uh, waste reduction is associated with process reengineering. I mean, what can a business organization do to put waste reduction into practice? The processes of uh, any normal organization are designed to, to do, to deliver, to serve a lot of things. Some of those things being delivered, a customer sees value in and is willing to pay for it. And those actions taken in the process, which an external customer is not willing to pay for, those are waste. And although there's always some internal customers that need to be satisfied, and sometimes it's the internal customers whose needs must be served by the process. We're, we're driven by, is the value perceived by the external customer? So you have to really understand who your external customer is and what is it that they value. So a necessary prerequisite for getting waste reduction in place is to identify the customers, both the internal ones and the external, of that process. And then once identified, really get close to them, truly understand what the customer sees value in, which, by the way, may be a moving target. Then you focus on driving out all the other activities. We refer to those as non-value-added activities. And to be able to drive waste out of a process, an intimate knowledge of the real process is necessary. You would be surprised the number of organizations that have no clue on what really happens from the very beginning to the very end of their process. There's people in the process who know what happens at their step and two or three steps before them and two or three steps after them. But very few people, including the managers, including the supervisors, very few people have a really good view of what's going on in that process. Having an organization that's comfortable truly evaluating every step in the process and every workaround, that's where a lot of waste occurs, train people so they can create a map of that process, literally a picture of the actions that take place in the process on a daily basis, and then for each action, ask a simple question. Would the customer see value in this action and be willing to pay for it if they knew about it? I know the most effective teams, whether it be football, basketball, baseball, whatever the case may be, when everybody understands everybody else's responsibility, it, it seems like those are, are the most effective teams, and clearly that, that applies to business as well. A, a moment ago, Chuck, you, you said that you're not clairvoyant. That being said, I'm going to ask you to kind of look into your crystal ball, so to speak. I've watched from afar how process improvement has changed over the years. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell everybody how old I am. I'm going to keep that to myself. But what will process improvement, in your opinion, look like in five years, maybe 10 years down the road? 
It'll still be based on the accumulated foundational tools and concepts that led up to today's Lean and Six Sigma process improvement initiatives. Now, however, with computing power becoming cheaper and cheaper and much, much more distributed, with all sorts of data gathering devices becoming cheaper and more reliable, there will be an ability to generate streams of data, not just individual data points, but streams of data from multiple parts of a process across multiple pieces of the organization and even between the external customers and the internal customers. There's going to be more software packages becoming available that can collect and evaluate data streams in real time. Process improvement will be entering and leveraging the world of big data. And because of the large number and variety of offerings in the area, pricing will be very competitive and you'll see scalable versions that will be available to be used even by smallest of organizations. We can expect to see greater streams of much less expensive data being analyzed in real time. And that will enable accurate decision making, rapid adjustments to the process. Overall, there will be a much increased utilization of expensive assets, whether those assets happen to be people or they happen to be capital. It will also be possible to understand the needs of our customers better as these streams of data between organizations get larger and fine-tuned. So companies will be able to design, produce, and deliver tweaked or customized version of products and services that more closely match the evolving needs of the customer. Data will become so cheap, so available, it will be necessary to have an in-depth understanding of the organization's system and underlying processes in order to leverage the data. Otherwise, you're just going to get overwhelmed. If the organization doesn't have a good understanding of its own processes, it will be much, much more difficult to take advantage of this coming flood of data. That's what I see coming down the pike in the next five years. <laughs> I have no clue. Computing power, big data, those, those words pop up all the time now. Chuck, on behalf of our audience and certainly our, our team here, in Austin, thank you again for joining us. Along with going to Firefly Consulting's website, how else can people communicate with you? Any information you want to leave our listeners with if anybody has any follow-up questions, etc.? That's probably the easiest way. Of course, everybody's on LinkedIn, so that's, that's an alternative to understand where I'm coming from. Outstanding. Well, we will, and as we, we mentioned and have mentioned whenever we have a guest on, we will have Firefly Consulting's other background, other contact information included in the description of the podcast. Well, Chuck, I know you travel quite a bit. Safe travels to you. And once again, thanks for joining the Big Bit Theory. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. Go to the podcast description, as I mentioned, and we'll have details on how to reach Chuck and or Firefly Consulting. What did you think about our visit with Chuck there, Tony? I learned so much about corporate structure and how to... Uh, you know, essentially um, make processes more efficient. And uh, it was pretty, a pretty good uh, interview. Yeah, I said it during the interview. I have heard so much about Lean Six Sigma. To actually visit with somebody who knows far more than we do uh, about what's going on with that movement uh, sure was interesting. And I guess Chuck reinforces also, Tony, don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes we go through our day-to-day, our week-to-week, our month-to-month, and we never stop and ask the question of, hey, how can I do X better? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, again, thank you to, to Chuck there. It's now time for your biweekly dose of crazy bids. The The state of New York put out a bid. Uh, well, uh, Tony, I'm going to turn it over to you. What has what the state of New York been up to? Yeah, I've, I found this interesting, honestly. Um, basically, it's a campaign. Uh, it will be aimed at reducing stigma associated with drug use by changing the ways drug users are perceived by the community. Uh, basically, health healthcare organizations and by themselves in the effort to increase access to health care and improve health care outcomes for drug users. I think this is really a, a way to um, attack our overcrowded prison systems and try to, you know, change the stigma and focus drug use as a health issue and not a crime issue. Speaking about the personal use, not, of course, not the um, trafficking and things of that nature. Yeah, sure. I, I think it was interesting. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, when I, when I saw this crazy bit, I thought to myself, well, you know, can the government legislate, dictate how people are going to feel about drug users? But I'll add this, if it's going to help people, if there's a chance it'll help people, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. Do you know any other details about the bid 
specifically? Yeah, the department anticipated awarding up to uh, one contract for a maximum of two hundred grand, and they anticipated the contract term in November 1, 2016. And to kind of give a comment on what you said before, there's been some other countries so far that have changed their policies, and they've done in the last 10 years, and there's been tremendous uh, results from that in a positive manner. So, you know, we really, you know, need to take that data and really analyze it to see if what we're doing here is working or if we can actually do something more efficiently and better. Uh, Again, it's the crazy bid segment, but not sure that that's a crazy bid as much as uh, an interesting bid. And again, we'll see, uh, we'll see what takes place in New York once that bid has been awarded and the program has been implemented. As always, we thank you, friends, for downloading, sharing, and following The Big Bid Theory. Don't forget we're on Facebook and LinkedIn. And please, 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 Tony's sitting here. He's got his hands like he's praying. Like our Facebook page, and you can also connect with us on LinkedIn. Tony, we'll see you next time, compadre. Hey, thanks. It's always a pleasure. Use bcallhain at bidprime.com to contact me via email. And Tony's email address is tcallis at bidprime.com. That's Chuck asked me the other day. It's Callas, K-A-L-L-A-S, T Callas at bidprime.com. On the Twitterverse, check out our Twitter at the Big Bid Theory. Easy for me to say. My Twitter is contract underscore hunter and Tony can be found out on Twitter land at Anthony Callas. By the next time you visit with us in two weeks, will we be talking about the Cubs, No Jinx, and the World Series? Tony? I think so. It's looking very positive right now. The Cubbies are on their way. We'll have another Crazy Bids ready for your thought and enjoyment next time. On behalf of the TBBT staff, frantically realizing they better improve some of their processes, for Tony Callis, I'm Bill Colhane. Until next time, Cubs fans or not, go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs, and we wish you all the best in growing your business. Yeah, the big, 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 big.